This is chapter 37, baby, baby, oh baby. So just a quick review of the anatomy. Uh, this is the uterus. It's a muscle and it stretches and grows in response to the growth of the, of the embryo and then the fetus. You'll notice there's the uh, fallopian tubes and which the eggs travel down into the uterus. Uh, you have the ovaries which produce the eggs. And if the patient is sexually active and they, an egg needs a sperm, it implants, and uh, an embryo is created, and it turns into a possible viable pregnancy. I wanted to point a couple of things out really quickly. Uh, the cervix is down there at the neck of the uterus. The cervix gets plugged with a, a waxy substance to seal off uh, the, the uterus during pregnancy. When the, the mother starts to deliver and the cervix starts to dilate in response to this, that, uh, that waxy plug is going to be uh, released and it's called a bloody show. They'll have this discharge of, of this waxy substance and a little bit of blood. And what's, what's telling everybody is that the cervix is beginning to dilate to get ready for the child to be delivered. The other, on the other end of the thing is the fundus of the uterus. I've circled it there in red. And you can kind of see um, where it is located right now. Keep that in mind. We'll talk about it a little further here in a, in a couple more slides down the road. Now, uh, the, the patient has, uh, has been impregnated. They have a viable pregnancy that's implanted in the wall of the uterus. And these, uh, these, they, they, the, uh, the embryo goes to various stages. And around 24 weeks, on average, uh, the child gets to the point where they, they could survive with some assistance outside the womb. So any pregnancy before 24 weeks, like 22 weeks or 19 weeks, normally the child's not developed enough to survive outside the womb. And if the child does deliver that early in the pregnancy, uh, then the child doesn't survive. Uh, but at, at about 24 weeks, uh, if this if there is this is a premature delivery, uh, it's, it's possible with our assistance and keeping them warm and bag valve mass ventilations and maybe even a little CPR, the child can make it to the hospital, and they can go to the NICU, the the, the neonate intensive care unit, and they can put them in in, a, in, a, in, a, in an environment that can allow them to grow and survive on their own for a few weeks until they get big enough and strong enough to to go home. So you can kind of see the, the process here. Um, the uh, pregnancy on average is, is about 38 to 40 weeks. It's broken into three trimesters. Uh, there's obviously three months each. So trimester one is the first three months, and then the second three months, and the third three months. And each trimester has its own possible risks and complications. We'll talk about it in those three phases. Usually the second trimester is the, mo is the most stable and the safest uh, for, for patients. But and with the first trimester being probably the most uh, the, the most dangerous for a pregnancy. So now you can see this is a full term pregnancy. This is probably nine months. Notice now where the fundus is. The reason why I bring this up again is is because once the child completely delivers and once the placenta, that organ you see up on the top there, uh, delivers, then uh, we can massage the fundus of the uterus externally. Uh, and what that does is it causes the, the uterus to contract uh, and controls the flow of the flow of the, the flow of blood. On average, uh, a patient, when they deliver a child, loses about 500 cc's of blood. That's an average blood loss of a normal, healthy delivery. If there's complications and if they have what's called postpartum hemorrhage, that exceeds that 500 mLs, then we're talking about having to to various uh, ways of controlling this bleeding, and one of them is to massage the fundus. Now you'll notice the placenta. The, the placenta is a, a solid organ. It's full of blood, and it's the it's the it's the life support system for the child. Uh, this is implanted into the wall of the uterus, and it exchanges gases and it exchanges nutrients with the baby and the mother. Even though the mom and the baby don't share the same blood, they do exchange gases. Uh, and nutrients and things like that. The baby needs to survive while in the womb. Uh, this organ, of course, is you can see this is normally an implantation. 
there are some normal present some abnormal presentations that are a problem. We'll talk about those in a couple of minutes. Now, when it comes to how the patient's body changes during pregnancy, so obviously when the body recognizes that the patient is pregnant, they releases hormones to uh, to support that pregnancy, which can lead to physiological as well as emotional changes. Um, because of a number of reasons, because of the much more mass of the body now, as this child grows and the amniotic fluid that the baby is suspended in uh, grows and the uterus grows and all that, uh, the, the mother and the baby need more oxygen. So mom might be breathing a little bit faster and a little bit deeper, you know, just a couple of breaths faster. Also, when they get into their ninth month or their third trimester, uh, the weight of the baby starts pressing on the diaphragm and the abdominal organs which can make it a little harder to breathe. So, but that's just a normal process for them. And, and like you might have known already, is that you know when we're probably pro providing oxygen, uh, if we have a, a woman who's uh, a patient who's pregnant, uh, we're we're a little more free with the giving the oxygen. We're not that worried about free radical release and all that. We're more worried about keeping the baby and the mother healthy. So, a nasal cannula at two liters or four liters. Whatever's appropriate is 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 not is not bad, even if they have fairly decent oxygen levels when you get there. Um, the patient does uh, get a greater blood volume. I think it I think it increases by a liter or something like that, or a liter and a half or so. I don't remember the exact number, but again, this is just increased mass and all that. Um, the uh, the placenta is is highly vascular. It's got a lot of blood, and there are some issues with trauma and bleeding. We'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, gastrointestinal problems, well, because especially in the, in the last three months of pregnancy, the baby's going to be squeezing all those abdominal organs uh, pretty tightly. And so uh, it slows down gut motility and the, the, the food moves more slowly through the mother's gas, gastrointestinal tract, leading to constipation. Uh, patients also get hemorrhoids from this as well. And you might notice the baby's head is resting right on this patient's bladder. You ever, ever wonder why uh, pregnant patients have to pee a lot? I guess that's probably what it is. Also, you notice in this picture down below, uh, due to this weight change, so to speak, uh, this, uh, this patient is kind of out of balance and they, they can't see their feet, so they trip and fall. If they do fall forward onto their stomach, it could be a very serious uh, fall. So we go on, on, on patients who have you know, broken wrists or they hit their head. Luckily, they twisted their body to avoid, you know, hitting their stomach because they were concerned about their child, rightfully so, but they could have other injuries involved. And anytime you have a, 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 a pregnant patient of, of, of any gestational period who has been struck in the abdomen in any way, uh, they need to go to a trauma center to be evaluated to make sure that they're not bleeding internally. Now, the reasons why we get called out for uh, patients who are pregnant, the number one reason is going to be more than likely spontaneous abortion. This is a case where the patient was sexually active. There was implantation of, a, of, a, of an embryo in the uterus. And at some point within the first three months of pregnancy, usually most commonly in that, that time period, that first trimester, the body, her body, uh, recognizes that this this embryo is not viable and uh, uses the same mechanism that the patient uses every month to, to prepare for pregnancy. It washes out this embryo by, by washing away the, the, the inner lining of the, of the uterus and they have uh, a bleeding and bleeding washes, the blood washes out this material as well as the embryo. And so signs of this uh, is going to be, the patient's gonna complain of lower quadrant cramping and they're going to have bloody discharge, uh, similar to or maybe more than uh, than their normal period, and it's it's out of you know out of sync with their period as well. And either they know they're pregnant, or they think they might be pregnant, or they're sexually active. Um, remember that you know even though people, men and women, use contraceptives, uh, they're not 100% effective. I've I've got on patients who have gone through this. And they had no idea they were pregnant because the, the female was on, on the pill and the, and the guy was using a, a, a condom and the patient still got pregnant. So 
you know, don't get lulled into that sense of, oh, it can't happen, but it can. Um, and statistically, about uh, one in, in five first-time pregnancies, this is usually young women, uh, end in a spontaneous abortion. Um, normally, th these uh, situations are not life-threatening in most cases. There are some exceptions uh, to the rule here, but the bleeding is, is very limited uh, and your treatment is very limited basically to mo most, mostly moral support. There's going to be a lot of, um, it's going to be a lot of, uh, of fear and it's going to be a lot of, uh, of anguish about what happened. And they are going to think things like, well, they did something wrong to cause this, or they failed because they, uh, they couldn't have a baby and things like that. There's a lot of emotional stuff going around in their heads. But what I usually tell them is, is your body did not fail you. Your body did exactly what it's supposed to do. It recognized that this this embryo was not going to come to term or, or a full term, and it, it wasn't a viable pregnancy. And it it did nature did what it's supposed to do. It washed it away to prepare you for the next pregnancy. So you just you gotta remind them that they didn't fail. They they actually did their body did what what was supposed to have been done. You'll notice in this picture something's a little different about the placenta. You'll notice that it's in the wrong place. And this is placenta previa. Uh, this was implanted in the wrong location and it's blocking the exit, so to speak. So in the third trimester, when mom starts having contractions, um, what's going to happen is as that cervix dilates and spreads apart, it's going to start uh, releasing the placenta from the wall of the uterus and they're going to have bleeding. The hallmark sign of this is painless vaginal bleeding in their third trimester, and it's usually associated with uh, possibly their contraction phase, early in their contraction phase. So maybe they, you know, maybe they're not really due, they're not actually not going to deliver for you know, another five or six hours or something like that. But as the cervix is gradually dilating in preparation, you're going to see this bleeding, which is not normal. And again, it's painless. The other one, abrupto placenta, this is, uh, you can see the placenta is properly placed, but due to trauma, and this is the most common reason why this happens, some kind of blunt force trauma to the abdomen, could be a seatbelt from a car accident, uh, could be a, a kick in the stomach or a fall onto their stomach. Uh, those are all potential problems. So what happens is, is the placenta either partially or completely uh, separates from the uterine wall leading to a bleeding uh, in the in the uterus and it does two really bad things one the mother's losing blood and the baby's not getting oxygen and nutrients so if this is severe enough the baby dies within a few minutes and the mother can die as well from massive hemorrhaging usually what you get with this get with this is you get a history of some type of blunt force trauma to the abdomen and now they have some kind of a bloody discharge uh, and a cramping pain. I, I had one lady call it a, a pinching pain uh, with the one that she had. And this was from a seatbelt in a traffic accident. This can also happen spontaneously for medical causes. Uh, so again, you have a, a patient who is usually, it's usually in their third month of pregnancy, uh, the, the third trimester of pregnancy, sorry. Uh, and you're going to get a history of some type of blunt force trauma uh, to the abdomen. But again, it can still happen from medical causes as well, and it's painful vaginal bleeding. Uh, this is pretty rare, uh, but it can happen. This would be happening during the, the, the contraction process. The, the patient has begun their contractions. Maybe they're within hours of delivery. And as they're you know, trying to move this child out of, the, uh, out of the uterus down the birth canal, what happens is the baby kind of makes a right turn and goes out the uterine wall instead rather than through the, the cervix. Um, the most common reason why this happens is more than likely in a previous pregnancy the mother had a c-section and the physician went in and opened up the abdomen, opened up the uterus and removed the child through the wall of the, the abdomen rather than vaginally. So when they sewed this thing up you have the scar tissue and, and the scar tissue now on the uterus is much more it's 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 much more easily torn and this happens or 
the patient has had multiple vaginal births. She's on her fifth or sixth or seventh child and it stretches and kind of makes the uterus more fragile in that case. Um, so this is going to happen during this contraction phase and even though normal birthing contractions are painful, this is apparently excruciatingly painful and if you if you were to look at the the normal the normal symmetry of uh, of a of a patient's you know a pregnant patient's abdomen it's very symmetrical it's very spherical if the if the baby is poking their head through the uterine wall you're going to see this kind of uneven looking bulgy looking thing bulging out that's the head pressing out against the uh, the abdominal wall uh, but they're going to be screaming in agony and you need to take them to a hospital that has a surgical capabilities to deal with this. They're good. The child is going to have to be removed through a C-section. So you need to go to a hospital that has a labor and delivery department and drive really fast to the hospital. Ectopic pregnancies are very common, especially in, uh, in young patients, young females. Um, you can see what happens here. Uh, they, uh, they release an egg. It meets the sperm in the wrong location. It implants in the wrong location, and it, it even it's a viable pregnancy, meaning that this thing's going to start to grow, and it's going to go in, into this pre-embryonic pre phase and then embryonic phase, and it's going to grow bigger and bigger and bigger, and at some point, it's going to it's going to rupture surrounding tissues, and the number one problem with all this is is it causes internal bleeding, and this is a truly a life-threatening condition for for these patients. So if you have a a, a any patient of childbearing years and who is sexually active and they have lower quadrant abdominal pain and or or both vaginal uh, bleeding this is more than likely an ectopic pregnancy and they need to be rapidly transported to a hospital that has some kind of surgical capability uh, they do not need to go to an L&D department because obviously there's no labor or delivery uh, but as like a trauma center would be, would be great for this uh, I've had patients in this condition, young, you know, young patients in their 20s, and their blood pressure is you know, like 60 over palp when I get there because they're bleeding, just pouring blood out into, into their abdominal cavity. So, uh, you know, even though they might be stable when you get there, uh, there's a risk of them rupturing and, and bleeding out internally. Um, some patients get what's called preeclampsia, and this would be uh, used to be called toxemia of pregnancy. And what happens is, is their body releases proteins, which leads to vasoconstriction of our blood vessels, which leads to a lot of the bad things. Uh, one thing it does is it leads to hypertension, uh, so high blood pressure. And so if, if a patient becomes pregnant and goes to their physician and gets their, their prenatal care, they go in every couple of months to get checked out. This is going to get caught pretty soon in the process, and the, the, the doctor is going to take steps to help control the preeclampsia through medications as well as bed rest and other, other mechanisms. Um, and, of course, they can get swelling to their face, their hands, their feet, and this is the edema because of the vasoconstriction. It's forcing fluid out of the blood vessels. Uh, into the surrounding tissues leading to that, that edema that you, you might see with like someone who's having a like heart failure kind of situation, but it's a different mechanism. Um, the big problem here uh, is eclampsia. Now, because of the proteins and because of the vasoconstriction, these patients can have grand mal seizures, whole body tonic-clonic seizures, and you know during those seizures that these patients don't breathe. So... And these, these, these seizures, a lot of times, will be status epileptica seizures, the ones that last more than five minutes. Now this is a risk to the patient as well as to the patient's uh, uh, child. So this is when you're going to be getting out the bag valve mask, doing BVM ventilations on this patient, and rapidly transporting them to the closest ALS facility, whether it's a paramedic unit or whether it's, uh, whether it's a fire station or whether it's a hospital, so they can stop this seizure and save the child and the mother. Oh, uh, one more thing is supine hypotension syndrome. So looking at the picture here, you can see this is a full term baby. It's properly positioned. The difference is, or well, the problem is here is the baby's head is putting weight on on the the vena cava. And as you remember, the vena cava delivers blood back to the heart. 
And so if you squeeze the vena cava, less blood is getting back to the right side of the heart, less blood is getting back through the lungs into the left side of the heart, and less blood is being pumped out, which means the blood pressure drops. And if blood pressure drops, uh, for the mother that's bad, but then it's even worse for the baby because the baby gets fed from the mother's blood. So if mom's hypoxic and, and hypotensive, then the baby's going to be hypoxic and hypotensive. So they're kind of connected, unfortunately, at this point. So you want to have this person, if you see, uh, uh, this is usually in the third trimester. So I would say any, any pregnant patient who's 20 weeks or greater in their pregnancy should go onto their left side when they're sleeping or being transported to the hospital on the gurney. The left side does a couple of great things. One, it's anatomically the most effective to, to prevent this, this situation. And also, if you, if you lay them on their left side as an EMT, you'll be sitting on the right side of the ambulance because that's where the bench seat is. You'll be able to talk to them, see their face, and monitor their airway. So it's a win-win in all ways. It, the right side works just as well, but the left side is preferred for a number of other reasons. So scene size up. So your primary assessment is going to be pretty much the same. You're going to talk to the patient, get their level of consciousness, uh, see what's going on. She says, I'm having contractions. Uh, oxygenation is necessary. Check their skins. Do what you would normally do in a normal primary assessment. And then you're going to get your sample history. Now, sample history, you're not going to be using OPQRST because it's not appropriate for a patient going through the, uh, this pregnancy process. Uh, but you're going to ask a lot of questions about the pregnancy and any complications that are you know, possibly there. We'll, there's a whole bunch of questions we'll get over. We'll, we'll cover here in a couple of seconds. Uh, we do need to ask about gravida and para. So gravida is how many times the patient has uh, had been pregnant. And this includes any in either spontaneous abortions or therapeutic abortions. So if they've been pregnant seven times and they have five children, and but they had one uh, therapeutic abortion, then you can kind of see that how that works out. And para is how many times they've had uh, births, how many how many times they have birthed a child from the birth canal. Uh, so para is how many births, how many live births, or how many children they birth. And gravid is how many times they've actually been pregnant. So if, if a patient says they're gravid of five, uh, para four, that means they have four children or have delivered four children, and they have one on the way, essentially. Now, midwives. There's two types out there. There's midwives and there's doulas. They're, they're trained uh, coaches for delivery. A lot of women are now delivering at home. Either uh, either a wet, uh, in the in the bathtub or the jacuzzi or they have birthing sling, uh, swings and all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, you might encounter these people. Now they're not medically trained. They're not nurses or doctors. They have some limited training. And if something goes wrong, they're going to call 911. So if the child if the child delivers in in distress or they think the child is going to deliver in distress they're going to call 911, you're going to arrive there. And remember, the, it's still, the mother is still the patient, and you talk directly to the mother, but don't forget about the midwife and the doula. Be respectful and maybe have one of your partners uh, talk to them about what's going on, get a history of what's happening, what their concerns are. But your, your, main, your, your main priority is the mother and then, and then the infant. So, uh, but work with them as much as possible. Uh, getting, getting confrontational with a doula or a midwife really complicates the, uh, the whole scene. So all these sample questions to ask. Uh, this patient's probably going to call because they have contractions. They're starting their, their, their delivery phase. So you want to know how far apart their, their contractions are. Any contraction less than two minutes between each contraction, frequency-wise, uh, that means they're getting pretty close to delivery. And then you want to know how long each contraction lasts. Any contraction that's longer than about 60 seconds is pretty much getting close to that delivery process. Also, they might feel this uncontrolled urge to bear down or have a bowel movement. This is that need to kind of con to, to push, that they have kind of an involuntary need to push. And they have that. If you have contractions that are less than two minutes apart, and they last longer than, than a minute, 
and they have this feeling, feeling need to bear down, they're probably really close to, to delivery, and you should probably get ready to get things going. It's good to know if they have any prenatal care, because if they have not had any prenatal care, then nobody knows what's going to be coming out, whether it's a healthy baby or an unhealthy baby, or what's, what's going to happen here. If they, uh, if they have prenatal care, they might know about any expected complications. Maybe they've had previous C-sections, or maybe they've had previous stillbirths, or maybe the child was in, 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 uh, in the wrong position in, in, the, uh, in the uterus, in what's called a breech birth. And do they plan to breastfeed? Though not a high priority at this very second, uh, but once the child's delivered, they probably want to do that. So you want to, so you want to go with that because that's their, that's their wish. Uh, obviously, you will want to know about gravidon para. Has the water broken so the amniotic sac will break at some point during the, uh, the, the, the delivery phase? And you want to know, or you might be able to see, see it yourself. It might be on their clothes that they take off. But is, is it clear? Is, does it smell? Is it greenish in color? If it's greenish in color and it smells kind of foul, this could be meconium staining. And that is the uh, feces from the, uh, the infant. And it means the infant's been stressed or distressed in some way inside the, the womb. And they had a bowel movement, which, which just colored the amniotic fluid. And it's a sign that the child's going to come out uh, very distressed, like not breathing and maybe even no pulse. And of course, any problems with, with, with previous births, any, any, any previous you know, C-sections, because what we talked about earlier with the ruptured uterus. And due date's really important because, um, you know, again, if you're delivering a, a premature child, uh, it's, it's a different process because these, these, these children will come out uh, not quite ready to deal with living outside the, her, the mother's body. You're going to have to support them with BVM ventilations, uh, keep them warm. Again, maybe some compressions possibly as well. If depends how far along they are in their in their uh, in their gestational period. Now, labor and delivery. Uh, you guys can watch the video on Canvas, and then of course in the lab, I'll show you the the skill, and you'll practice the childbirth skill in the lab to get an idea what it's like. So there's three stages of pregnancy or delivery, should I say. So first one is, is dilation, and this is, takes the longest. On a first time pregnancy, this could take up to 18 hours or more to go from, there's no dilation of the cervix to full 10 centimeter dilation of the cervix. A lot of times, first time uh, pregnant uh, pregnancies, the patient will start having contractions. They may or may not have their bloody show. Uh, they may or may not uh, rupture their, their, their amniotic sac, but they have contractions and they go to the hospital and the, the doctor or the nurse will go out, go there and they'll, they'll actually check how dilated their cervix is. If it's only one or two or three centimeters, they'll send them home and come back tomorrow, come back tonight, whatever, come back in 12 hours and we'll talk about it again. And until the cervix fully dilates, uh, the child's not going to deliver. The whole thing here is, and the reason why we ask how many pregnancies they've had and how many kids they've had, uh, if you if you have a patient who's on their fifth child, if they've, they have delivered five children previously, and this is their sixth uh, pregnancy, uh, they're going to deliver a lot faster. They can go from contractions to delivery in less than a half an hour. So it's really important to ask how many babies they've had because that might tell you how much time you have and whether you can get them to the hospital without having to you know go through that process in the field. So first stage is dilation that's the longest and then once this dilation you know is, is, is going um, now when it comes to uh, contractions uh, there's a thing called Braxton Hicks contractions and this is called false labor. This usually happens in the third trimester, sometimes, sometimes even late in the second trimester. And the doctors surmise that this is the uterus, the, the, the uterus's way of like building a muscle for the, the big event. Uh, these are painless uh, cramping sensation uh, of the uterus contracting, and especially a first time mother they might misconstrue this as having contractions and, the, and they're actually going to have the baby when in fact 
the amniotic fluid has not ruptured, the, the cervix is not dilating, and they have not had their bloody show. This is purely just a case of the uterus is prepping for the big, the big event in, in a month or so from that, from that time. So they still need to go to the hospital because uh, the doctor needs to evaluate that these are truly Braxton Hicks contractions or not. Uh, if there is, if they are having contractions and they are bleeding, then that's not Braxton Hicks. They need to go to the hospital rapidly because they're having something else going on. But uh, these are you know, non-life-threatening, uh, non non-medically threatening contractions. And but again, encourage them strongly to go to the hospital. Okay, first stage is done. Second stage would be the expulsion stage. This this could last five minutes or, or an hour, depending on the circumstances. Again. The more babies they've had, the faster this is going to happen. The babies primarily are cartilage. Their bones aren't really calcified yet, and they're very, they're very like gumby bears, so to speak. So they come out, they come through the birth canal all floppy, and they have to kind of like do a duck dive to get around the pubic bone. And, and when they come out, they come out face down. And the first thing we do, as soon as the head expels, the first thing we do is we check for a cord around the neck. Remember, there's the umbilical cord that links the baby to the, the placenta. This can sometimes wrap, wrap around the neck and needs to be freed before the child can be delivered any further. I believe it's one in every four uh, deliveries are what's called a nuchal cord, which is the cord around the neck. So you would then free that cord one way or the other, and we'll explain later how to do that. Uh, and then the baby starts to rotate. The baby will rotate to one side where the, now their, their nose is facing laterally towards the thigh. And then the shoulders will come out. And the shoulders are the next biggest part of the body. Once the shoulders are cleared from the, uh, the, the pubic bone, the kid comes out, kind of squirts out pretty quickly. Again, they're kind of gummy bear like And just be careful as you're doing this because they're really slippery. They've got this kind of white, waxy substance on them. And it's, it's sort, of, sort of a lubricant for getting through the birth canal. And it's rather slippery and they're kind of wet and everything. So you can drop them. You don't want to drop them. It's really bad form. So a child's all, all, all the way completely delivered. And the third stage is the placenta delivery. The, the placenta will gradually dislodge from the uterine wall naturally. Uh, and after between 5 and 20 minutes later, this will happen. And the mother will have uh, some mild contractions. There'll be a gush of blood. And this, uh, this, this organ will expel from the vaginal canal. It comes out kind of a, a round grapefruit-shaped uh, object, and then it quickly flattens out into this pancake shape. Uh, this needs to go to the hospital with us. Uh, and there are some cultures that use the placenta in ceremonies. Either they eat it or they use it to plant a tree with as fertilizer. And a lot of women now are using it. They, uh, they, they process it, turn it, I think they freeze-dry it or something like that, and they turn it into pills, and they can actually harvest the stem cells from the cord as well. So these, these actually do get used now. So the mother's going to want their placenta at some point in this process. They, we just can't leave it at home because we need to have the doctor look at the, the placenta, make sure that it's, prop, it's intact and it's healthy. If there's a chunk missing from, the, from this organ, it's probably still implanted in the uterine wall. It didn't come free. So now this, this now you have this case of this this patient's going to be bleeding uh, a lot, and they can actually have what's called postpartum hemorrhage and die from this from this uh, excessive uh, blood loss. So when this organ comes out, we're going to take a, a quick glance at it, make sure it's all intact, put it into a plastic bag, transport it to the hospital. If the mother wants to leave it at home, just explain to them that the doctor needs to see it for their own safety and for the baby's safety. So baby has come out completely, uh, and uh, now you have two or sometimes even more patients. Now, what you normally would do is one EMT would go and care for the mother the entire time. So that EMT would be asking the sample questions, getting the blood pressure, pulse respirations, uh, applying oxygen, and the other, the other EMT would be preparing to, to deliver the patient, uh, or, the, or the baby, should I say, putting on a mask and gown and gloves and all that stuff. Uh, but if you have, you now have two patients, what if you have another baby or another, what if they have triplets? 
So, so you need a, 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 an EMT for the mother and you need one EMT for every patient or every, every, every new patient that you have, the baby. So if you have a triplet, you need literally four EMTs, so it's time to call additional resources. Now, when it comes to uh, assessment, so the number one thing is to protect the child from heat loss. Uh, they're very prone to this. You want to dry, warm, stimulate with clean, clean towels. You, know, you want to wrap them up in a swaddling as quickly as possible. If their airway is completely blocked with secretions to the point where they cannot breathe, and this happens with the meconium staining sometimes, their mouth gets full of this thick, kind of a uh, soupy look, uh, looking substance. That's the only time we suction and we use a, a, a bulb syringe. Now, kids are predominantly nose breathers. And so we, while they have this substance inside their mouth and nose, we want to not stimulate their first breath just yet. So we're going to suction their, their mouth first, get as much junk as, as we can, and then we'll suction the nose, which should probably stimulate them to start to, start to take a, their first breath. Um, and then, of course, the cord's going to need to get cut. So after about one minute has elapsed, by this time, by the time you dry, warm, and simulate, and possibly assess for suctioning, um, it's been about a minute or so. It's time to clamp the cord in two places and cut between the two clamps. And what we use as our primary assessment uh, for neonates, newborns, is what's called APGAR. And you, will, you will need to memorize this. So it stands for Appearance, Pulse, Grimace, Activity, and Respirations. Each category is broken down into 0, 1, or 2. So the two points are the max for each category. So when it comes to appearance, appearance is, is color of their skin. If the child is all pink, they get a 2. If they're mostly blue with some pink thrown in, they get a one. If they're all blue, they get a zero. If their pulse is is greater than a hundred, they get a two. If their pulse is between sixty and a hundred, uh, they get a one. If it's below sixty or they have no pulse, they get a zero. Grimace is more uh, how, how annoyed they are. Essentially, they're gonna they're gonna scratch up their little face and they're gonna cry and they're gonna they're gonna kind of just be angry because they're, they're cold and they're out in the real world now. The really strong grimace is a two. A weak grimace is, is going to be a one and just no grimace, no activity in that respect is going to get a, a zero. Activity is, is going to be moving of their limbs. They should be actively moving their limbs, pushing you, pushing away, pushing at things. If you, if you think about it, they, they've been in the womb for nine months in this kind of fetal position and and they like this little kind of tight fetal position. If you grab their gently grab their their legs and you pull their legs out straight, they'll resist. And that that that, that resistance, that activity, if it's strong activity, they get a two. If it's a weak activity, they get a one. If they're limp, they get a zero. And respirations come down to effective, ineffective, and absent. So if they, if they have good effective breathing, which should be around around 40 breaths per minute or so normally when they, when they come out of the womb. Uh, that they get a two. If the breathing is ineffective and you have to support it uh, in, with oxygenation, they would, would get a one. And of course, if they're not breathing at all, uh, they would get a zero. So the max here is, a, is 10 points. Most kids come out of the womb around seven or eight. And within about a minute of your, of your simulation and assessment, they'll pink up completely and become a 10 within a couple of minutes. Now, uh, I mentioned earlier that, that, uh, that children come out of the womb, they come out blue, either partially or completely. And the reason why this is, is because they come out of the womb, uh, when they're delivered, they're, they're, they're hypoxic to the point where their oxygen saturations are probably in the 60s or 70s. And this is done on purpose by nature to, to, to force the child to take their first breath. If the child came out fully oxygenated, well, you know, 99% oxygenation, then their brainstem wouldn't recognize to take the first breath. So the child comes out blue because that's basically they're, they're cyanotic. And so uh, usually just drying, warming, simulation is all you really need to get this, this whole thing jump started. But sometimes, and rarely, sometimes the child comes out 
and they're they're either then they they're not taking their first breath quickly enough, or if they are breathing, it might be not uh, effective enough. So we're going to have to support this. So let's say you, you you deliver the child and you dry, warm, and stimulate, uh, and you notice that they haven't pinked up. There's they're still uh, at, at about what the one minute mark. They're still mostly blue, uh, but their pulse is above 100. Their breathing is okay. You know they're breathing fine, but they're just not really you know catching up with that cyanosis. And then what we would do is, is take a, 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 some oxygen tubing or a small infant mask or pediatric mask and do what's called blow by oxygen. Just hold it next to their face. We've already dried, warmed, and simulated. We've already wrapped them in a swaddling to keep them warm. Uh, but you do this for 90 seconds and monitor the child. And if they, if they pink up completely, then that's wonderful. You're, you're kind of done with the process. Uh, if at some point or any point, their, their pulse drops below 100. Uh, whether they come out that way or whether they gradually develop that, as soon as you recognize that their, their pulse is below 100, the first thing you're going to do is bag valve mass ventilations on room air. And the reason why on room air is because, remember, the reason why they take that first breath is because of the hypoxia and the cyanosis. So we don't want to give them too much oxygen because we don't want to hinder that normal, healthy, natural process. So you can, you can do bag valve mass ventilations for 90 seconds if their heart rate's between 60 and 100 uh, or, or, or under, under 100 beats per minute. After 90 seconds, you're going to reevaluate this child. If they pink up and they're doing fine, then you'd probably just go back to maybe some blow by oxygen at that time and transport to the hospital. If at any time, uh, if, if their pulse if their pulse does not respond to your VVM ventilations on room air, and it drops below 60, uh, then you start com chest compressions, and with oxygen uh, now with your BVM. So now you bump it up to 100% oxygen, and then this this reassessment process is every 90 seconds. So you start off, you dry, warm, stimulate. You do your first APGAR that should be at one minute. You notice that there's cyanosis still after that one minute. You try some, some blow by oxygen because their pulse is above 100. But after 90 seconds, you notice their pulse has dropped to 80. So now you put the, you put the BVM on there without oxygen and you do that for 90 seconds. Uh, and, uh, and when it comes to the, the BVM rate, so rescue breathing for a neonate is one to one and a half seconds each breath apart. So you're gonna for every second and a half, you're gonna give a, you're gonna give a squeeze on this. It should be a two-person BVM. One person should be holding the mask and a jaw thrust. The other person should be ventilating approximately one to one and a half seconds, 40 to 60 breaths per minute uh, for uh, for a neonate. Now, if that doesn't work, it's been 90 seconds, and their heart rate drops below 60, you'll you will then continue the BVM. You'll hook it up to oxygen, and then you'll your partner will take will encircle the torso with their hands and use their thumbs to to do chest compressions and it's three to one ratio so it's one two three breathe one two three breathe one two three breathe that's proper cpr you do that for 90 seconds you reassess the child if they pink up if their heart rate comes back up again uh, then you go back to 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 the blow by oxygen so just be, be familiar with the neonate resuscitation tree uh, and the county protocol for this in the uh, in this particular protocol, then of course we're going to reassess mom. Uh, at, someone's going to be doing this. The other person is going to be checking mom out, checking for postpartum hemorrhage, checking the need for oxygen, getting in this set of vital signs, comforting them, talking to them. So if you notice that now the the child is delivered completely, the the placenta is now delivered as well. And you notice that this patient is still bleeding actively from the birth canal. Now, most pregnancies, a patient will lose about 500 milliliters of blood. That's a normal, healthy pregnancy and delivery. But sometimes they do get what's called postpartum hemorrhage. And again, this is why what I mentioned earlier about, the, about parts of, of the, the, the placenta being left in there and things like that. If you recognize that this you know, there's more blood loss than normal, then you can what's called massage the fundus of the uterus. 
you can see the process. You take one hand, you cup the one hand right by the pubic bone, and what you're doing is you're supporting the fundus on that on that on that lower end, and then you're just you're putting your other hand and you're cupping them together, and you're just you're just kind of massaging the between you the the fundus between your two hands, and you're kind of rolling around and massaging this, and then again this stimulates the uterus to contract, and when it contracts, it squeezes the blood vessels and reduces blood loss. Um, and of course, at this point, you would have probably already have, uh, if the baby's healthy, you would have had the baby to breast, so mom's now probably breastfeeding, and the breastfeeding re releases Pitocin, uh, which helps to do, to helps control bleeding as well. It's a, it's a natural hormone that mom releases. It's called, it's actually called oxytocin is the official name for it, I guess. So now when it comes to your documentation, you need to document uh, an APGAR at one minute and then again at five minutes. So the initial APGAR and then five minutes later and then I would say at least five to 15 minutes after that all the way to the hospital. You need to document how many, how many children they've had previously, how many live births and how many pregnancies. The name of the person cutting the cord it could be you, it could be the father, it could be a firefighter. Uh, the time it was cut and the address of delivery and because you now you have two, two patients, you need two patient care reports, one for the child and one for the mom. If you have two, pa two children, you, then you would need three patient care reports. This is a, what's called the San Diego County Out-of-Hospital Birth Report. So you need to fill this out at the hospital once you get there, after you've uh, turned the baby and the mother over to the doctors. You'll fill all this out and you'll give this to the mother or the father. They need this document to get a birth certificate from the County of San Diego. Without this, it's very difficult. So fill that it out. It's pretty straightforward. It, it covers all of like where 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 the the, the uh, delivery occurred, the time, uh, who cut the cord, who was present. It's, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, and then you you give them uh, a copy of this and they take it to the, the county. Uh, certain types of abnormal deliveries. So the, what I've seen out on the field a couple of times is even though the baby delivers through the birth canal, the amniotic sac is, has not ruptured. So it's really simple. It looks really weird when it comes the baby comes out because it doesn't look like, like, like a baby. It looks like some kind of alien. But that being said, what you do is you, you just take your two fingers and you snap or pinch over the crown of the head. It ruptures this membrane, but then remember this is full of amniotic fluid, probably a liter or more of amniotic fluid, so it's going to get messy. So do it over like over a blanket or something and away from you, so because all this fluid is going to gush out. And then once you, you once you uh, once you, you once you snap the membrane and it cracks open, you can just easily just easily just pull it away from the child, free the child up, and after that it's just a normal childbirth. You're going to suction the airway if necessary, only if necessary. Dry, warm, simulate, uh, cut the cord, you know, whatever you need to do in that normal process. Uh, prolapse cord. Uh, the average umbilical cord is about 18 inches long, and sometimes what will happen is the cord will get trapped under the baby's head and it will prolapse out the vaginal canal. And the problem with all this is, is the baby's head's resting on the umbilical cord, and the baby's still inside the womb, like you see in this picture here. So they're getting less than normal flow of blood from the placenta. This is almost like an ABC issue for the baby. Uh, if you are doing your vaginal exam on the, on the mother and you notice that there is a bit of umbilical cord protruding from the, uh, from the vaginal canal, this is you, you put on a sterile glove and you, you put your hand inside the vaginal opening and you put, take your hand, you, you lift the child's head off of the um, off of the cord, and you place your the mom in, in what's called McRoberts position. This picture right here, where you see how the, the patient's uh, hips are elevated on a blanket, and they're laying in a supine position. So what you're doing is you're trying to encourage the the infant to slide back up up the birth canal, back towards the womb, and take the weight of their their head off of the umbilical cord, and you rapidly transport to the nearest L and D department. Um, because the, the doctor needs to relieve you of that of that uh, of that position with your hand, you keep your hand in there uh, until you're relieved by a physician at the hospital. 
uh, breach birth, kind of a similar situation. Baby comes out butt first. Um, it's usually the child comes out pretty okay, but what the problem is is the, the head's the largest part, and the head kind of gets stuck on the on the, on, the, on the pubic bone, and they, they they'll stop there, and they won't, won't be able to proceed much further. And what happens is because the cord is now outside, because the body's outside. Um, the cord gets crammed between the vaginal wall and the child's head, so you have kind of a, a, a similar problem there. Also, on top of all that, uh, you can have a situation where because the child's face is is in the vaginal, it's kind of resting in the vaginal wall, and the torso is outside in the in the outside in the air, the child might start trying to breathe on their own. And they're not going to, be able to breathe because their face is kind of crammed into the wall of the of the of the vagina. So you take your two fingers and you're going to create an airway. Slide your hand under it. and notice how in the picture the person is supporting the torso of the child while at the same time putting two fingers into the birth canal and creating that V shape uh, to allow the, the child to breathe if they do so, start breathing. You're going to do this for about two minutes. Uh, if this, per this child does not deliver in two minutes, then you're going to start rapidly transporting to the hospital. Usually, uh, they do they do two or three minutes. They they will they will deliver, and it'll be a normal delivery after that. Uh, mother should be placed in McRoberts position as well, so in that hips hips raised position, like we talked about earlier. And then again, after two, one to two minutes, then uh, start transporting. Limb presentation, there's not much you can do about this in the field. This is, needs a physician to either do a, 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 do some kind of C-section. But uh, this would be, a, again, McRoberts position, uh, that hips elevated, laying supine, rapid transport to the hospital, so, so support the, the mother with oxygen and keeping them warm. Um, not much else you can do. Multiple births, of course. Uh, if you know if, if the if mom has one uh, baby and her, her abdomen is still really big, uh, maybe it's time for, for you know, who knows, twins or even, even triplets. What it really comes down to is, is uh, a lot of times uh, when they do have twins, the twins are, are in the womb up opposite one another, kind of yin and yang kind of thing, where one's facing down, one's facing up. So the first one might come out normal head first. The second one might, might come out slower and come out breech. So the first one might deliver just fine. But it might be 10, 15, 20, 30 minutes before the next one delivers. So just I would just say start transporting. Uh, unless there's a sign of the other ones coming out quickly, uh, I would start transporting to the hospital. And then if it does occur in route, then pull over and then proceed with the second one. And this is why we need you know, two, at least two childbirthing kits in every ambulance because twins are, are uncommon, but you know, it does happen. Just remember that they, the second one can come out breech. So it can come out bottom first which again has, has a complication. And this is, a, this is that uh, meconium staining. This is the feces that the child released because they were distressed. This, I, know, I, know, I know that's Campbell's soup, but it kind of looks like that sort of sometimes. It could be a very light tinge of green or it can be very, very thick green as well. It depends on how severely they, they've been distressed. You can see the picture right there, that green on the child, that's all meconium. And again, we only suction their airway if their airway is completely blocked with these thick secretions. And then preemies, like uh, the definition of any pre premature birth is any child under the, the normal 38 weeks of gestation. Uh, appearance, now they, again, if it's below 24 weeks, their eyes might be fused shut at this time. They probably will have no pulse uh, and they won't be breathing when they come out. Again, at or, at or after 24 weeks, uh, they were, there's a better chance of them surviving. So that's pretty much the, the cutoff for us. So that's why we'd like to know the due date and how long, you know, the, how, long, uh, how long they've been pregnant and all that. Um, so if they do come out preemie, our highest priority, of course, is airway, breathing, circulation support. They're probably going to need bag valve mass ventilations. you got to keep them warm. Uh, they're very, very prone to hypothermia. I'll show you guys in the lab how to do that properly. And then lastly, uh, actually, just, just, just kidding. We're done.